Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the October Fireside Chat here at the Library Company of Philadelphia. My name is Fran Dolan. I'm the Director of Operations, and I'm very excited about this evening's chat, Laboring Lives, Households, Dependence, and Power in Colonial New England with Dr. Kaylin Carbonell. So welcome to the October Fireside Chat, especially to those who have never been here before. It's always exciting to see new faces, even if you are just names and black boxes out there. It's always great to expand um, what we're doing here and introduce more people to the library company. Um, so again, I'd like to welcome everyone. I'm coming to you live from a somewhat dreary, rainy Philadelphia. So it is a perfect evening um, to gather around the Fireside Chat um, and to engage in what is sure to be an exciting talk here. So the Library Company of Philadelphia was founded in 1731 by Ben Franklin and some of his like-minded friends. And the idea was they could acquire books um, and share in the knowledge of them together. Um, and that is essentially what we're still doing now, almost 300 years later. While the library company has changed over the years, its core function of disseminating knowledge out into the world and preserving books for future generation remains intact. These days, the library company awards over 60 fellowships a year, the vast majority of which go to support scholars in the areas of early American history. Uh, we have wonderful programs in our program in African American history, our program in early American economy and society, um, women's history program, visual culture program. So we have a ton of different things here. Um, and just about everything we do is free and open to the public. Um, much of the support from the for the library company for our core operations comes through our membership and shareholding program. You can learn more about that at our website, uh, which is librarycompany.org. We can also get uh, learn all about upcoming events that we have there. And again, almost all of these are free and open to the public and go to really support what it is that we're trying to do here at the library company. Dr. Caitlin Carbonell is a historian of race, gender, and power with a focus on unfreedom in colonial New England households. She earned her PhD in history from William and Mary in 2020. Dr. Carbonell has served as an NEH fellow at the Omahundra Institute of Early American History and Culture and a Hench post-dissertation fellow at the American Antiquarian Society. She is currently the interim book review editor for the William and Mary Quarterly. We are very excited to have you here this evening, Dr. Harbinell. So welcome. Take it away. Okay, thank you, Fran, so much for that kind introduction. Um, and thank you to the library company um, for setting this talk up and for giving me this opportunity to share some of my work with you tonight. Um, and then a final thank you to the virtual audience um, for taking time out of your evenings um, to attend this talk. I know it's pretty busy time of year, um, kind of a dreary day here as well. Um, so um, I'm really looking forward to um, this opportunity to share some of my work with you um, and to the Q&A and discussion following the talk. Um, so with no further ado, I'm going to try to share my screen um, and my presentation. And um, I do have a more specific title today, um, which I did not share originally with the um, Kind of publicity for this talk, um, but the title is A Tale of Stolen Honey, Laboring Lives and Hidden Stories in Colonial New England. Okay, so my research and my talk today um, deals with households, with families, and labor in colonial New England. Um, I'm just going to switch slides. Um, as a historian, I am driven by questions about gender, about race, and about power. But I'm really interested in how these broader dynamics play out on the ground. And so I often consider really the granular and the everyday scale at which I believe we can better locate the lives and the stories of really diverse individuals. So in my research, as well as in my teaching and my public work, I'm committed to telling these more full and complex stories, which I believe really more accurately represent the diversity of the past and in doing so often challenge our understanding of that history. Moreover, my project engages urgent questions about how we tell these stories. So I'm really committed to thinking about how we can make use of an archival record that has really been written and preserved by a few powerful individuals to locate the many who did not leave behind such records. 
To do this, I work with a wide set of written material and visual sources. You can see some of these kind of pictured on the screen here. Um, these vary from, you know, account books and family papers to furniture and clothing. And I come up with creative methods to press this interdisciplinary archive for these diverse stories. At the same time, I'm really interested in how we tell these stories in both academic and in public venues, whose subject positions we inhabit, and how we fold complex but also quotidian stories into the conventions of historical narrative. So I'm going to be talking a little bit more about some of that today. Um, so I'm currently working on my first book project on these topics. It is tentatively titled Laboring Lives, Households, Dependence, and Power in Colonial New England. And with my time this evening, I'm going to give you kind of a brief overview of that project before going into some more specific examples from my research, which include the tale of stolen honey that my title to the talk alludes to. So this book is at its core about households and the people, free and unfree, who lived and labored within these shared spaces. Many of these households looked something like the one that you see pictured on the screen. And this is a portrait from New England um, around 1740. It's a portrait titled John Potter and Family. And in addition to free individuals like John Potter, who's pictured here in the red coat, as well as his wife and his daughters, Many households included unfree laborers, like the boy who's pictured here, likely of African descent, um, who was likely enslaved to the Potter household. In 17th and 18th century New England, many households were mixed labor settings. They included indigenous, um, African, and European women and men who served as indentured, hired, and enslaved laborers. And with this project, I peer in on households and their daily goings on at really a granular level to think about the intimate contestations and collaborations between free members of households, so men like John Potter, um, who were often referred to as household heads, and this group of individuals like this enslaved boy here, um, who were seen as dependents. And that's a group that included legally unfree laborers, hired workers, and children as well. So what I'm really interested in is the kind of behind the scenes of a portrait like this one in thinking about how these groups of free and unfree people lived and worked together really on a daily basis. In colonial New England, the household was the foundational unit of the society and the economy. And so it offers us a frame for examining the daily interactions of these diverse New Englanders. I like to think of households as containers for social and economic relationships, but I think that it's important to note that these were porous containers and that they had permeable boundaries. So households weren't permanent groupings of individuals, as a portrait like this one might suggest, but they changed size and form over time as individuals were born and died, as they were married and divorced, or as they joined and left households for temporary stays as laborers, as students, and for various other circumstances. So to give just one example, um, and I've got the quotation here on the screen, when Thomas Amory and Rebecca Holmes were married in Boston in 1721, Thomas wrote to his new father-in-law, quote, my marriage was on the ninth past. This week we have got to housekeeping, end quote. While the marriage was the foundation for their household, Thomas continued in his letter, quote, our concern is to get a good servant or a black housemaid, end quote. So as Thomas and Rebecca and these women and men that would labor for them negotiated their relationships to one another, they formed a household. However, as I think this example also reminds us, even though the household model engendered a degree of interdependence, households did not always live in harmony as they were often centrally structured by relationships of unfreedom. So my work joins a growing conversation among historians about how we might critically approach the archive to get at the lives of people who did not leave behind archival sources. But it brings these questions, it brings these questions to a place that's marred not only by its silences, but also by archival shouting. Stories of colonial New England have long focused not on these diverse people, but on the white men who are featured in these portraits. 
the merchants and ministers, the farmers and fishermen who headed households and who generated ample documentation of their daily lives, producing most of the records with which we work. My book cuts across this archive to wrest these stories from their authors, instead centering the diverse members of their households who often appear only marginally in these records. And I think that this is well illustrated in this portrait um, on the left-hand side um, of Boston merchant Samuel Shrimpton. Um, so this is a 17th century portrait. Um, and if you look extremely carefully, you can see in the back right-hand corner of um, Shrimpton's portrait, there is an enslaved or presumably an enslaved boy who sits in the background surrounded by ledgers and appearing to help keep accounts. Um, and I've looked at this painting, this portrait pretty closely. Um, it's pretty dark. It's pretty difficult to see this boy unless you're really looking for him. And I think that's kind of the message here is that you need to look incredibly closely and you need to often look into the margins, right, to pull these people out of the kind of dominant um, visual of people like Samuel Shrimpton. So my work also has implications for how we think about economic history um, and how we expose hidden labor. So tasks such as those that were captured by these two boys in these two colonial portraits, as well as that of many other dependent laborers of varying statuses and backgrounds. I challenge our view of the colonial economy as the product of white male heads of household, and I show that their economic strategies depended on and were shaped by the essential collaborative labor of these diverse household members. So when a New England reverend wrote, quote, I studied my wheat and flax sowed, end quote, his diary reflects, reflects the essentially invisible and yet indispensable labor upon which his ministerial pursuits relied. By focusing not on reverends, but on the enslaved and hired laborers whose work made their ministry possible, I argue that we move toward a view of the economy that's centered on households with diverse actors. And finally, I think my work extends beyond early America, especially in its implications for studying the vital experience of living and working in a household. I argue that the household is an urgent historical subject and that bringing our attention to these structures and the people within them reframes our understanding of myriad topics from gender to the economy to the history of race and slavery. My project reveals that households were not natural or static configurations as we often think of them, but rather they were complex and messy arrangements of relationships that were continually in flux. So by bringing households into motion and revealing the interactions and negotiations between those who lived and worked together, my work ultimately shifts how we're thinking about family, invisible labor, and authority in colonial New England, as well as in the world today. So I'd like to share with you a couple of different examples from my project, as these offer a view of how I reanimate these households to shed light on these diverse and often marginalized members. And I'm going to begin by highlighting one story in particular. This is the tale of stolen honey from the title to my talk. And this comes from a chapter in my project um, that's on collaborative labor and that illustrates um, the kinds of labor that my project exposes, as well as how this interpretive framework can offer a new understanding of early New England's history. So the example that I'd like to begin with concerns a court case, and it was on its face about the theft of beehives, thus the tale of stolen honey. It was framed in the courts as a trespass that was brought by one propertyed Connecticut colonist against another. However, I'm going to tell this story not from the perspective of these two white property men, but from that of a woman who lived in the defendant Joseph Rose's home, a white servant named Abigail Cobb. So Abigail is going to be kind of our protagonist. So as you will notice, Abigail's version of events, which were relayed in her verbal testimony, which was preserved in writing by the clerk of the court, and you can see it here on the screen um, from the Connecticut State Library. Um, her version of events decenters the trespass and the bee stealing heist. It focuses instead on the aftermath of these events within the Rose household. And in doing so, Abigail's narrative offers an alternate version or an alternate vision, sorry, of what labor looked like in the Rose household, revealing the important collaborative labor that she and various dependents performed. 
So by centering Abigail's story, her version of events as told in this testimony, I'm going to show how we might begin to think about this diverse group of individuals who lived in colonial households and the ways in which their daily labor undergirded the colonial economy and society. So the alleged bee heist took place in 1731 in Groton, Connecticut. And you can see um, on the map on the left that um, Groton is right along the coast of Connecticut. It was, um, it's in New London County. Um, so these records are all from New London County. Um, and so Abigail's story begins on a Sabbath day morning when she, the 11 year old white servant, Abigail, was preparing to milk the cows. She was preparing to milk the cows when she noticed that one of the milking pails was missing. So Abigail asked her mistress, Sarah Rose, where the other pail was. But instead of responding verbally, her mistress took her finger and she put it into one of the pails and then to her mouth, urging Abigail to do the same. By the taste, Abigail realized that the pails were filled with honey. The next day, a Monday, Abigail's mistress brought her a basin of honey to eat. And when Abigail asked where it had come from, she expressed surprise that Abigail did not yet know. When Abigail confirmed that she did not, her mistress told her that it was from a tree that they had got. Now, in colonial New England, gum trees were frequently used as beehives. Um, and so this reference suggests that the roses had removed a hive from a neighbor's land and from their tree. So later that same Monday, Abigail heard a conversation um, between her master and mistress in which her mistress condemned what they had done as stealing. While her master said there was really no harm in what they had done. From Abigail's hearing, her mistress agreed to take part only under the condition that she would get the beeswax. Even if Abigail had not found out about the bees from her mistress, the theft could not have escaped her notice, for traces of the bees lingered throughout the Rose home. For one, Abigail noticed that her master's hand was, quote, very much swelled, and she understood that he had been stung in taking the bees. Later that week, Abigail's mistress told her that if she wanted any honey, there was still plenty in the barn. And when Abigail went to the barn, other servants showed her some of the honey, but most of it was upon the scaffold in the barn and under the corn stalks, where they would keep it hidden another week before they would drain it, a task that Abigail helped them to undertake. After this, Abigail helped to distribute the honey to her co-conspirators, as well as to a local shop where they exchanged it for pewter. Just gonna take a sip of water. Okay, so I find this story compelling for a couple of different reasons. First, I believe that it can teach us a lot about the essential role dependent laborers played in the colonial New England economy and society. Abigail's testimony makes visible the collaborative infrastructure and the many forms of hidden and overlooked labor that upheld the economies that men like Joseph Rose were given sole credit for. From her testimony, we catch sight of some of the labor that she and others, in this case, the male servants who she worked alongside, but also the many other Anglo-American, Native, and African women and men who labored across New England households contributed to household economies. For dependents like Abigail, daily labor comprised all types of small, almost imperceptible daily tasks, such as keeping tabs on the movements of the household, following the bidding of her master and mistress to accomplish tasks such as draining honey and carrying goods such as stolen beeswax to nearby shops. In their aggregate, these seemingly small daily tasks were in fact essential to the economy and society of New England as they provided vital connective infrastructure that helped to build and sustain the growing economy, just as they enforced boundaries between households and the larger community. By focusing on what economic activity looked like to Abigail and to the other laboring women and men like her, labor that largely remains hidden when we focus only on the occupational categories and the material outputs of household heads, we gain insight into the essential role played by dependents. This, I believe, reorients our view of the New England economy and society, revealing a collective construction that relied on the, the labor of household dependents. 
Secondly, I think that Abigail's story reflects the way in which archival records are often structured, as well as the ways in which I critically read and carefully narrate these to flip the script and to challenge these same structures. So this testimony is part of a superior court case from New London, um, New London County, as I mentioned. Um, it's a superior court case concerning trespass, and the case does not formally concern Abigail. Rather, it's about her master, Joseph Rose, who was accused by another property male household head, Samuel Whipple, of trespassing on his land and stealing his beehives. Abigail's testimony is structured in certain ways that reflect that legal framework. For example, as you can see here, the testimony introduces individuals by their relationships not to Abigail, but to Joseph Rose. So Abigail is described as living at the house of Joseph Rose. Her mistress is considered the wife of the said Rose, and other household servants are referred to as the boys of the said Rose. These configurations offer a reminder that such a testimony does not reflect Abigail's words verbatim, but was likely transmitted through a clerk of the court who took her story and transcribed it into written testimony. In that process of translation, Abigail's story became a story about Joseph Rose, the defendant in this case. To this end, legal writing offers an intentionally partial view of colonial society, focusing primarily on the concerns of white property men like Joseph Rose, whose names litter the docket. In this rendering, male household heads appear as central figures while their dependents, even when giving testimonies like this one, fade into the background as bit players. However, by centering Abigail's testimony, and moreover, by centering Abigail and other dependent members of the household, we gain an opportunity to flip the script, to view the colonial household from the viewpoint of dependent laborers. By privileging testimonies and by shifting our subject position to consider the perspective of intentionally marginalized figures like Abigail, these same records can be read to animate the household and to capture the dynamics that contributed to, surrounded, and even undermined the actions of men like Abigail's master. So in my retelling, this becomes a story about Abigail, her master, her mistress, and her fellow servants, rather than a story about Joseph Rose, the wife of said Rose, and the boys of said Rose, right? There are, however, um, some real limits to this method, and I want to showcase these rather than shy away from them, as I think they reflect some of the persistent challenges that myself and others face in locating and telling stories of laboring people in New England. The greatest of these is an imbalance in the record that allows me to tell a story of Abigail far easier than I might tell a story of a native or black woman or man, especially with such detail and from a nominally first person perspective. This is partly a reflection of the legal system and the social world of colonial New England. Black and native women and men were not expressly barred from testifying in courts as they were in many other contexts across the Atlantic world, but they were only rarely called to do so. And even in those cases when they were, they faced a much heavier threat of consequences if they chose, as Abigail did, to offer testimony that might hurt their masters or really anybody in their orbit. So there are thus far fewer testimonies that allow us to get even at the filtered speech of Black and Native New Englanders. So when they are mentioned in records, Native and Black New Englanders are rarely named. They're often referred to only by their perceived racial designations. Abigail's testimony speaks to this as well. So when the court questioned her further, she indicated that she believed her master had not acted alone, but that he actually had, quote, much company in taking the beehives. She specified that he had, quote, no less than four or five hands, three white men and the rest Indians, end quote. And she went on to name the white men, relations of her master, but she provided no further information about the native men who were pulled into this heist. These may have been free men who hired out their labor, just as they may have been servants or enslaved people who worked in neighboring households, but the records offer us few hints of who they are and how they fit into this story. As you can see on this mashup map um, from Yukon's Map Center, these native men may have been from a local tribe, perhaps claiming Pequot or Neantic ancestry. You can see where Groton is on the map down here. But without further details, it's really hard to identify them. And so instead, we're left with this kind of vague descriptor. 
Similarly, enslaved Africans are often referred to in these colonial records with the term um, Negro, a term that left them nameless and often even genderless with only the presumption of their enslaved status. While these archival challenges are particularly common for native and black New Englanders, they did not preclude laboring people of European or Euro-American descent. So while Abigail is referred to here with her first and her last name, allowing me to tie her words and experiences to an archivally traceable individual, other white servants, especially youth, were often referred to in records as boy, right? We, we saw an example of um, Joseph Rose's boys um, as girl, as maid, and as servant. And these terms are used pretty much across records. Um, and so this is evident um, in Abigail's testimony, and it's kind of across records from this period that there's a lot of references to laboring independent people are, are pretty vague and are not going to kind of give us enough um, evidence to really trace these people um, throughout their lives. So while we can tell this story from Abigail's perspective, we must really strain to consider the other laborers who remain only shadowy in this telling. To this end, my project steps beyond singular sources like Abigail's testimony to assemble myriad fragments. Abigail's testimony offers a starting point, albeit a skewed one, and I place it in the context of many other fragmentary glimpses from New England households to give a fuller picture of the everyday experiences of dependent laborers. My experience compiling these fragments from court cases like this one, as well as in diaries and letters and account books, has allowed me to isolate some of the specific types of labor that individuals like Abigail contributed to household economies. In my broader project, I consider several types of labor that Abigail's testimony introduces. So I spend a chapter of my book exploring support labor, including domestic tasks such as provisioning, clothing, and caring. In addition to support, I explore several forms of labor that are more often hidden or forgotten, labor such as watching, obeying, and carrying. And since I have limited time today, I want to go into more detail only about this last type of collaborative labor that my project brings into focus, so the labor of carrying. I've chosen this not because it is any more important than the others, um, but because it allows me to expand upon this, um, to expand upon one of the types of labor that Abigail's testimony really only hints at with the reference to the sale of honey in a local shop. In a society with very limited infrastructure, dependents like Abigail served as couriers. And in doing so, they helped to connect the households where they lived and worked with the surrounding community. So while household heads themselves filled this role at times, especially considering the social aspect of visiting with friends and family, they relied on their dependents to take on these more regular and less glamorous trips back and forth trips on which their economies relied. And so that's what I'm referring to when I use the word carrying. Account books, day books, and receipt books sometimes offer opportunities to consider the middle men and women who carried out these exchanges. And so on the screen, I have a page from um, Jonathan Corwin's um, day book or a day book attributed to Jonathan Corwin that is at um, the Phillips Library in Massachusetts. Um, and as you can see here, often in the margins, um, there are references to the people who performed this carrying labor. Um, so, sorry, so this is a day book um, that both Jonathan Corwin and his wife, Elizabeth Gibbs Corwin wrote in. Um, and each of these records signifies an economic relationship that the Corwins entered. These are primarily with white men, but they're occasionally with white women. And so that's the names that you'll see on the left, like William Smith. Um, but what's more intriguing here, and what I was starting to reference, is how they note often in the margins, um, not only the names of individuals who they traded with, but also the names of those to whom they delivered the goods. And so you can see here, um, when Elizabeth Corwin sold to Walter Palfrey uh, two quarts of rum, oh, I clicked too far, sorry, um, two quarts of rum, they were delivered to his boy. Um, just as below that, when uh, Jonathan Corwin, and I know this just because I know it's his writing, um, when he delivered to, uh, when he sold to William Smith a gallon of molasses, these were delivered to his, quote, Negro. Um, and this referred likely to a man that's enslaved by William Smith, just as the above reference likely referred to either the son or servant of Walter Palfrey. <clears throat> 
So in some cases, this labor was simply the physical labor of carrying, of carrying goods. Um, but at other times, these tasks required specialized knowledge as dependents were asked to sign receipts, to choose from a selection of items, and to assume control over the quality of these exchanges. As you can see here, account books and other records are filled with little slips of paper, which offer a sense of the types of materials that dependent laborers would have carried, passed along, and occasionally themselves signed. Um, for example, we know from the rich documentary record left behind by Jonathan Corwin and Elizabeth Gibbs Corwin that the pair enslaved a, ma enslaved a man named Sancho. So earlier records from Elizabeth's first marriage, um, she was first married to a man named Robert Gibbs, reveal that Sancho acted as a witness in signing receipts. And so you can see here on the left-hand side, um, this is in Elizabeth and her first husband's day book, and um, the, enslaved, the man that they enslaved, Sancho, signed with an S um, as a witness to that exchange. On the right-hand side, you can see an example of a letter um, between Elizabeth and her second husband, Jonathan Corwin, um, which indicated that Sancho was often responsible for this type of carrying labor, as when Elizabeth promised to send her husband bread from Boston to Salem and urged to have him um, to have Sancho check on its status and then carry that bread home to Jonathan. As they were sent on these errands between homes, shops, warehouses, and wharfs across early New England, dependents like Sancho gained entries to new spaces and opportunities to meet new people. This could lead them to form new relationships with other dependents who they traveled with along early New England's roads or who they met inside these spaces of exchange. Their labor shaped their opportunities to form social worlds across the households with which they um, within which they lived. So when taken alongside that day book that I showed a couple of slides back um, that belonged to Elizabeth and Jonathan and its references to the many dependent laborers who they did business with, we might imagine that these were individuals who Sancho would have formed relationships with as they carried out errands across the community. Lastly, such mobility granted dependents like Sancho knowledge of dispersed geographies, as well as connections that allowed them opportunities to run away from the households where they were bound if they chose this path of resistance. In other cases, their labor gave them opportunities for economic freedom or material resistance. So there's all types of ways in which this labor engenders opportunities for um, enslaved and otherwise unfree laboring people. As I argue, dependents were not simply unthinking cogs in the colonial economy, but rather they understood their role within this system and armed with this knowledge, they both collaborated with and resisted the economic strategies of household heads. This meant many different things. And while it often looked like willing collaboration, helping, for example, to drain the honey um, in Abigail's case, it could just as easily run counter to the strategies of household heads as when Abigail shared her knowledge of her master's heist with the courts. So I want to share um, just one more example, another fragmentary glimpse, because I think that it showcases this point. In 1747, an enslaved man of African descent named Luke was helping his enslavers to prepare breakfast in Lyme, Connecticut, so not far from Groton. That morning, his mistress asked her daughter, Anne, to pound some coffee. But when Anne grew tired of that task, she passed it off to Luke, another display of the collaborative economy at play. Later, after drinking coffee at breakfast, several members of the family became ill, with the two-year-old, Deborah, suffering the worst of it. Deborah died the following night, and when the doctors declared that the cause of death was poisoning, all eyes turned on Luke. Now, the accusations against Luke surely had to do with his position in this household as an enslaved person, but they were a reminder of the possibilities engendered by Luke's labor. Not only had Luke prepared the coffee that morning, but he had allegedly made a recent purchase of ratsbane, telling the shopkeeper that he needed the poison to kill a dog likely a task that he performed for his enslavers, or that at least that's his cover based on this idea that he might perform that task for his enslavers. Luke was ultimately acquitted, um, and the records of this case are actually quite minimal, um, but the accusations made against him are telling of what it meant to live in households and more broadly in an economy and society structured by unfreedom. 
For Luke, the accusations suggest the possibility, sorry, they suggest that possibilities for resistance and the vulnerabilities of unfreedom were really two sides of the same coin. For his enslavers, such an accusation reveals what they saw as the real fragility of the household economy, offering a reminder that to rely on unfree people to perform essential labor was to create a system that could be a source of its own undoing. This was an economy that depended on the collaboration of the unfree, engendering delicate and sometimes quite unstable circumstances rather than the fictive orderly little commonwealths that household heads really espoused, that they, you know, when they're writing about these households, they write about them as if they're very much in control. Luke's labor was valued and it gave him opportunities for resistance, but these up but these opportunities were ultimately circumscribed by a world in which white household heads, white male household heads primarily, shored up power through their legal and social privileges. Okay, so I want to return once more to Abigail, whose testimony invites questions of her fate. Testifying two years after the events at hand, Abigail may well have been protected by a completed term of service, separating her from her former master. This is a privilege that obviously Luke did not share as an enslaved person. Interestingly, however, and part of the reason why I chose to focus on Abigail today is that we can say something about her eventual fate. As I mentioned earlier, the use of her first and last name in the records is significant in that it allows us to trace her. It allows us to get a sense of her later life. And with public records, it's fairly easy to trace the teenage servant, Abigail Cobb, who went on to marry twice, first to a man named Samuel Adams, who lived in Canterbury, Connecticut, and second to the deacon Richard Hale of Coventry, Connecticut, the father of well-known Connecticut figure Nathan Hale. So as luck would have it, we actually can say quite a bit about Abigail's later life as it would bring her to live in a home that still today stands, the Hale Homestead, um, which welcomes visitors in the spring and summer months. And so this is an image of the Hale Homestead in Coventry, Connecticut. So I've been reflecting on Abigail's story um, for years now, and in the spring of 2021, I was finally able to visit the Nathan Hale Homestead, a house where Abigail eventually lived, but namesake Nathan never did. Um, for clarification, Nathan was born on this site. Um, he just never lived in the extant structure, whereas Abigail um, actually did. Well, this is an excellent historical site. Um, it has well-informed guides. Um, the stories remain for the most part white and male, as I think is well illustrated by this graphic on the right-hand side of the screen um, that was on display at, on site when I went to visit. Um, it shows primarily members of um, male members of the Hale family, as you can see. Um, and I say this not to make light of or to criticize the important historical work being done here, but to bring attention to a reality of many public historic sites across New England which reflect only a minority of historical experiences. These persistent problems of representation are largely a function of the challenges and the constraints of finding stories that accurately re reflect the diversity of the past. And these challenges are amplified by the limited funding that such sites receive, especially to carry out the careful historical work that's required to dig out such stories. I think that Abigail's story reflects the potential for reinterpretation. Although hers is primarily a story about white women, it does offer a way into thinking about the laboring people who lived and labored in these spaces, stories that are not currently reflected in the family-centric narratives told at the Hale Homestead. If we're asking the right questions and looking in the right places, I believe we can locate more of these people who moved through extant spaces and we can start to tell their stories. I've often found that the richest findings, especially those related to archivally marginal individuals, are most likely at this local and this granular level with an intense focus on a particular place at a particular time. So in addition to uncovering Abigail's story and her links to the Hill Homestead, my research has brought to light stories of Sancho and several other servants and apprentices who lived and labored in the still extant Corwin House in Salem, Massachusetts, which is today known as the Witch House because Jonathan Corwin um, was a judge in the Salem Witch Trials. And so this is another um, 
another place that you can visit. And, you know, when we uncover these stories, you can start to think about people like Sancho who would have lived and worked in a space like this one. I'm um, sorry, in this exact, at this exact site. I believe that the future of reinterpretation needs to operate at the community level, taking advantage of institutional and community knowledge of local collections, of the 19th century historians whose story rich but document poor narratives offer at the very least enticing clues that generate questions and possibilities. There is so much stuff out there, especially for New England. There are so many surviving material and paper fragments. And if we start to place these together at the local level, there are real opportunities to tell stories with much richer casts of characters than we have previously imagined. So in the coming years, I really hope to be a part of this change. Now, as I begin to conclude, I want to consider what Abigail's story might teach us. I'll just end with this slide on um, here. So first, I think that Abigail's story raises important questions about how we study people and events that were, for the lack of a better word, ordinary. Many of the stories that I uncover in my research are just like Abigail's. Heists aside, these were about the stuff of everyday life, um, of everyday life, from milking cows to exchanging honey, um, all types of labor like that. And while these stories can teach us a lot about what it meant to live in a society and economy structured by unfreedom, they aren't exactly the types of stories that make their ways into textbooks, timelines, or public monuments. They don't always say much about change over time or fit into narrative, the narrative structure with which we tend to tell histories. So how to represent these stories, not only in my academic writing, but especially for public audiences, is something that I pose as a vital question, and it's something that I continue to grapple with. Stories like Abigail's, as well as the many unnamed laboring women and men hidden in the records, need to be told but I think that telling these stories will force us to reckon with the methods and the structures with which we communicate histories. Second, I think that Abigail's story has implications for how we think about the economy, both in the past and the present. So as I've shown today, Abigail's story is really a case in point for why looking at the local and the granular scale matters. It's at this micro scale of inquiry that our view of the colonial economy and of Joseph Rosa's position within it shifts, and we can see the important role that Abigail and other dependents played. But I also want to argue that this can shape our thinking about the present day. When we think about the economy today, it is easy to forget about the Abigails and the Lukes that undergeared so many sectors of the economy. These are the essential workers that the pandemic briefly shined a light on, but who have just as quickly dropped out of view. And while much of the labor of those who we deem essential workers has now moved out of the household, the labor performed in the home, often by these same workers as a second or even as a third shift, has long remained invisible. Although neither is a new issue, the pandemic has to some degree exacerbated and made manifest the extent to which our institutions and policies, in the U.S. especially, are ill-equipped to support these laborers. And as the pandemic um, continues to intensify existing inequalities, I raise Abigail's story as a reminder that we might take heed of how we define work and how we measure economic success, both in past and present, and whose perspectives we consider in such valuations. I hope that as we continue to tell stories of women and men like Abigail, these seemingly small stories will ultimately both change our understanding of the past and offer critical perspectives for how we make sense of the present. So thank you for listening. And I'm really looking forward to your questions and comments. Thank you so much for that, Kayla. That was really, really interesting. Um, now I'd like to turn it over um, to the audience here for some questions. So um, I'll get you started. Um, I'm always curious to my work at the library company. I have the, uh, you know, the privilege of meeting so many different people who have such a wide, varied um you know, interest in the research that comes out of the place. So I'm always curious what draws you to a particular story. And here, you know, the larger story, but Abigail's story in particular, how did you get involved in it? And what made you want to pursue it? That's a great question. Um, I also <laughs> am very interested in asking people this. Um, for me, what's interesting about this story and the fact that I can talk about, I can talk about it for like 30 minutes um, is that on kind of first look, I would probably tell you that there's there's very little there. Um, and so what's interesting to me, I 
a lot of this project began with me just kind of reading court records kind of from the beginning to the end, rather than looking for something specific, rather than kind of going in with something in mind. Um, I mean, you know, I had larger questions um, and things that interested me, but I wasn't looking at a particular type of case, right? I wasn't looking for a specific person. Um, instead, I was just kind of reading to get a sense of really what mattered in this society, right? Um, and I, you know, I've always been kind of reading with an eye for women, for enslaved people, for servants, for people that are kind of on the margins or for these kind of dependent members of households. Um, and so, but I was struck by how, almost how rare it was to find them, right? Um, so I'm reading and reading and coming after case after case about like stolen livestock. And I'm, I, I learned from this. I, I mean, so at first I found these cases quite boring. Um, this, I mean, this is among many cases that are about stolen trees, stolen apples, stolen cows, stolen sheep, right? I mean, a lot of the cases in the colonial records, um, at least in the kind of uh, everyday court records, um, are about kind of these daily concerns about property. If you think about it, it makes sense that that is on everyone's mind. It is their major concern. Um, so for me, what was interesting was kind of, uh, I don't remember exactly when, but kind of having an aha moment when I realized that that actually could tell me something, um, that in fact, the kind of mundaneness and um, also just the fact that so many of these cases are um, at least formally about these white male household heads and about their property concerns, um, the fact that I could make something of that was really interesting to me. And so just that idea of how we can flip these cases on their head um, is I think what ultimately got me interested. Um, this case in particular, I so I was interested for, in it um, primarily for, I think, what it tells us about the household and this idea that it kind of refocuses our attention on the household. Um, but it was a while before I realized that Abigail Cobb was Abigail um, Hale. And so that aha connect, moment. Yeah. So that connection really got me. And that was like, I thought it was probably near the end of my dissertation. And I had come across this case like years earlier. Um, so that was really exciting. And it was really, really cool to go to the actual site. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, we were chatting before the start, and you're saying how much you enjoy the research phase. And it's clear that you just kind of really dug into this. And then some things really that came across, you know, kind of drew you further into it. So I think it's really interesting. Um, so we have a question from Alana O'Donnell, who asks, which, uh, thank you for this really fascinating talk. I wonder if you've come across any examples of more marginalized laborers expressing a sense of the contributions they made to the local national economy and society. That's such an important question. Um, and I, I wish I had like more of this. I wish that there were more sources where laborers are kind of explicitly grappling with or even just showing that they understand their like their uh, their role, right? Um largely it's quite rare, right? So for the most part, I'm working with records that are written from the perspective of these white male household heads. And so I have to kind of read through to get a sense of what is important. And what I am declaring important is kind of based on actions most of the time, more than, you know, a dependent person actually expressing that their work is important. Um, so rarely, um, I have seen a couple, I've, there's a letter I have seen from, um, from a, you know, a household head, um, recognizing that that labor was important when, um, so I was reading this letter and he writes, you know, um, so I think that their family had been dealing with, uh, smallpox or something. And so he was, you know, he's talking about how, um, you know, how their enslaved woman died. And then their um, it's like this really sad letter actually, because if you think about kind of the, um, the impact of, uh, of disease, but so I think their enslaved woman had died and then, um, and then the boy who was like staying with the family in this kind of servant role, but it undefined. And he writes this comment where he says like, oh, like it must've been some help to the family. Like it, it's, you, so you see in these tiny glimpses that like, oh, they might recognize that. But a lot of the time, I think it's not necessarily there. And it's me kind of stepping back and taking a look at, you know, where we see that, um, where we see that labor actually having an effect. Um, Unfortunately, I think this question really gets at one of the biggest challenges, which is it's just so there's just so few records that allow us to ever like get into the and kind of enter the mindset of um, dependent people for the most part. Right. I mean, this is a rare record where we even have Abigail's perspective, at least nominally. Um, thank you for that. Uh, so Tom McNally asks, 
Did you know about the about Abigail's connection to the Hales and you found her testimony? So I not, I not originally. Yeah. So not, and I had even like worked through this case and you know written this piece about collaborative labor. Um, and it wasn't until I don't know, like I'd been already thinking about this case for other reasons for about a year. Um, that I I, I spend a lot of time looking, thanks to genealogists, um, looking through kind of um either Ancestry or various other genealogy websites, just trying to trace people um, because sometimes you do get these weird connections. Um, and it wasn't until that that I realized this connection to the Hale Homestead. So I was really excited, um, but yes. Um, I have another question. Um, if you have a, a moment in, to go into a little bit about the story of the enslaved man, Luke, and the poisoning of the family, I guess that story didn't go the way I thought it was going to go. Uh, when you started to tell it, it's really, it seems interesting. Yeah. Uh, so I wish I actually don't know a ton here. Um, it's kind of the nature of these records that I'm working with. So I work with, um, I mean, I work with lots of different types of sources, but a large portion of my sources are from the file papers from um, the file papers from the New London County records. Um, and there are associated trial records, which would have kind of like, they might have the, um, uh, like the verdict, for example. Um, but a lot of the times the file papers is just like a collection of like any paper that I was associated with the case. And so it's like the writs and the affidavits and attachments and testimonies. And sometimes there's a verdict, but there just often isn't. And so it's basically a very fragmentary record. And so I know little about this case, except I do believe there is a verdict here that says he was acquitted. Um, and let's see, I, I know very little. I will say I also was surprised. Um, and I think, I think my surprise not only has to do with kind of my larger sense and context of kind of how enslaved people are treated right in, in this world, um, but also the fact that there are several cases where um, enslaved people are accused of and convicted of, you know, poisoning white families. And there is this, um, whether or not they did it, right, I think that this kind of fear of um, the enemy within, right. Um, and so I was also very intrigued by, by Luke's case. And I, I have no idea if, you know, maybe like there could be some other side story, right? Like I have no idea why, like they might've had a good sense of the fact that Luke actually had nothing to do with this. Um, I was really, really interested in the fact that Luke, um, that it was clear the way that like the court records were written, it was clear that Luke was being accused um, because he had bought rat poison. And that to me is so interesting because I think it speaks to, I'm always aware like in colonial homes that you'll see like, you know, guns and things like on the walls. And you're thinking about the fact that you're living in this society where these English families are, these Anglo-American families are living with, you know, enslaved people. And yet they have access to their children. They have access to you know, weapons, they have, they have access to things like poison. And so I think it's very interesting to think about what that means, um, kind of from every perspective. For sure. Um, looks like we got time for another question. Um, I'm curious about the categories of unseen labor, Dr. Carbonell asked, particularly the obeying category, what sources formed her definition and understanding of that labor? Oh, I'm glad, um, that, uh, you asked this, um, because, so this is, I'm, I'm working through in the kind of writing process um, categories, right? I, I, categories are super fraught, but they're also very helpful to us in terms of trying to make sense of some of this. Um, and obeying has always been something that I'm not quite sure if it works as a category or not. Um, so I will always take suggestions if anyone has ideas. Um, but I use it because there are many, many different court cases and other records that reference dependent people, both servants and enslaved people who, excuse me, who um, are kind of, uh, they're kind of like dragged into their master's crimes, right? And and so it's kind of like in this case where Joseph Rose goes and steals these beehives and he apparently has these native men with him. So there's all of these cases, especially these property trespass cases where, um, you know, a white male household head will be accused of, of stealing something, but in the actual testimonies, you'll realize like he wasn't even always there. Like half the time he wasn't there and instead it was his servants or it was his slaves. And so often um, you see these, these groups of dependent people who are carrying out these tasks that um, I don't quite know how to define it other than kind of obeying, right? That they are 
Um, they are following the commands of the household head. Um, and I'm trying to grapple with what that means um, and what that means both in a legal sense, but also in a societal sense um, that you, this is a society in which households are kind of harnessing the power of dependent laborers against one another. Um, and it's something that I'm really thinking through. Um, and so that's kind of what I mean by obeying, but I think that there's probably more there. Um, I think one final thing I'll say is that I was really struck by the language of, um, in colonial records, there's frequently this, this language of doing one of master's bidding. Um, and so they bid me to do this, um, or he, or I obeyed. And so those two kind of um, words really stuck out. Um, and so I think when I'm thinking about obeying, that's the kind of language that I'm trying to um, to place into a category, um, but I'm not entirely sure if that's where it's going to end up or how it's gonna shake out with the writing. Um, all right, well, uh, you have any final thoughts then for us, Dr. Carbonell, before we wrap um, it for this evening? <laughs> Not really. I thank you so much for having me. Thank you um, for this opportunity. And if you know anyone is welcome to contact me um, via email or Twitter, whatever. Um, and I'd love to um, I'd love to answer your questions or share resources with you. Um, I I really think that kind of you know every once in a while you can give a talk and someone knows who Abigail Cobb is, right? That it's their relative and they know something about her. And so I think also like sharing information is so important. And so um, feel free to get in contact with me, but thank you so much for coming. And thank, thank you, you for thanks. hosting me. <laughs> thank you to everyone for attending Library Company's Fireside Chat this evening. Special thanks to Alison Kronstadt, who you guys haven't seen, but she is behind the scenes making this all happen. So thank you, Allison. Um, and thank you again, Dr. Carbonell. And if you guys want any more information about the Library Company upcoming events, you can check out librarycompany.org. And, and we will see you all next time. Have a good night.